In the coming weeks, locomotion reveals the global impact of railways. In Britain, trains inspired the biggest construction projects since Roman times. Across the world, imperial powers and revolutionaries spread their message by rail. Trains decided the outcome of wars and brought speed and luxury to travel. They shaped the past and may shape our future. Locomotion begins with the first impact of the railway on mankind. In the beginning, man discovered fire and invented the wheel. Several thousand years later came the railway. From that point on, the world entered a new age. The story of locomotion is the story of change. Man created the railway and then found he had to come to terms with it. The combination of steam and iron was a magic formula that would mobilize the present and transform the future. After the railway was built and the first train arrived, the people all looked at it with fear and admiration. They saw this machine with dozens of carriages and they said, how powerful these infidels, these foreigners are. It pulls a hundred coaches and it neither eats nor drinks. most interesting things in all of railway literature is to watch everybody comment on the notion of speed. Speed before railroads was measured in terms of how fast a canal boat went, how fast a horse went. But suddenly railroads went eight miles an hour, twice as fast as anybody had ever been. And when you got a railroad that went 15 or 20 miles an hour, people were scared to death. The countryside passed in a blur. They couldn't understand that a human being could go this fast on Earth and not lose parts of himself in the, in the process of the journey. And there were some funny things off speed. Stick your head out the window and spit into the wind. And it would come back and hit you before you could move your head, which is an indication of going just about as fast as man was built to go. The first travelers of the railway age were setting out on a journey through time and space into a world they themselves were creating. The railways invented the modern world before men for transport had depended on nature. They depended on the sea, they depended on the winds, the tides, they depended on animals. And now all of a sudden, here was a marvelous weapon they could use in their eternal struggle against nature. And they could use it to go as far as they wanted in the most inhospitable circumstances. People found it could do almost anything. And the longer they went, the more miracles they could achieve with it. I think 
the biggest single miracle of the railways was how soon they triumphed over the most extraordinary obstacles that within 10, 20, 30 years they'd conquered the Alleghenies, which were supposed to be impossible, they conquered the Alps within 30, 40 years, they conquered the Rockies, they conquered even the Andes. They got 15,000 feet up, 5,000 meters up in the Andes within 30, 40 years. Man dominated nature in a way that nobody had ever dreamt was possible. Science challenged nature, and men used technology to compete with God. The man-made glory of the railway age broke down the natural order that until then had governed people's lives. It changed man's relationship with nature. He could suddenly move through nature very, very quickly rather than wandering through it slowly. He could bypass nature. It was a sensation that they had never felt before. And it was something to tell their children and grandchildren for generations about what it felt like all at one time. It's amazing how quickly time passes. At the turn of the century, the railway seemed the wonder of the age, a miracle of technology, at least here in Russia, Siberia. It was a breakthrough into a new century, a new civilization. I remember when the railway appeared in this area and the trains were leaving. I really had this feeling of wanting to go with them as if they were the call of an unknown far away. You really felt you wanted to get on the train. It seemed that somehow, somewhere, there were these interesting places it could take you to. Some stations were well known. Travelers, whenever they arrived at a particular place, would say, right, this is the place for terrific cucumbers. You really have to try them. At another station, they would say, now this is where to get boiled potatoes. At every station, people came to the train and sold things. People enjoyed themselves however they could. They got to know each other. They played cards. The children were reading. Well, as far as kids go, they're the same everywhere. The children played. They got to know each other straight away. People began to tell each other everything about themselves. Ever since George Stevenson's rocket, wherever railways went, they inspired wonder and fear. The train was called the Devil's Carriage, the magic machine. It carried kings and commoners, soldiers and convicts. It brought people, towns and countries together. Along the way, the train left its mark on the world itself and on how people saw their world. One of the railway's most extraordinary impacts, and one that is very difficult to define, was, in a sense, the dehumanizing of travel, your alienation from the landscape. We're used to it. Because we've gone one stage further by traveling in giant jet-propelled tubes above the clouds, we don't think about it because we're so used to anonymous forms of travel. But for people who'd never known that sort of lack of contact, it was deeply disturbing. The railway was the first step in making travel less gritty, less earthbound, less in touch with the soil. I mean, it was a not a natural form of progress. Safely insulated from the elements, the Glacier Express in Switzerland ambles through the landscape. Cocooned in comfort, 
its passengers create their own inner world, where nature is merely decoration. Right across the valley is Vispa Terminen, where Europe's... In the new interior world of the train, the landscape was reduced to an accessory, there if wanted, but easily ignored. Inside the machine, new codes and customs evolved. Reading became a natural part of the process of moving from place to place when people lost interest in seeing where they were. Eating added to the sense of the train being a separate community, advancing through space in its own time. Train travel gave social contact as compensation for the detachment from nature. Life persevered inside the machine. In the world the railways were making, movement was en masse. Passengers left and arrived together. The new freedom to move was tempered by the order the railways demanded. Our clocks are all radio controlled. That means on each station you have exactly the same time. Time to Swiss railways is the most important thing you can imagine because if you have no clocks on the right time for railways, then uh, you will miss the, the timetable. Before the Industrial Revolution, before the railways, people went by the time in their vicinity, in their local town, in their local city. But the railways needed a standard time, which amounted to a sort of industrial discipline they had to impose in order to run railways, in order to run their trains regularly, so that they were providing a service which people would want and so on. So what they did was effectively impose their own grid, impose their own standards, impose their own discipline. So that by 1850 in England and 1880 in the States, you had a standard railway time. Railroads, because they had to operate to the minute uh, to prevent wrecks, uh, to, to make connections between railroads, had to redefine time. And they did it initially by taking time and putting it up on the depot. And that became railroad time. The depot became the center, the center of towns and villages. It's the place where things happened. It's where news came in, where the telegraph was situated, where merchandise for the stores arrived, where newspapers came in, where virtually everything happened, where people left. You went to meet friends and greet friends, say goodbye to your lover, whatever else happened. You did it at the depot, and, and you had to do it at the time the train arrived or departed. And therefore, the depot clock became the central timepiece in every village and hamlet in the country. Before the advent of railways, we used to have only four timings, morning, noon time, evening time, and night time. So if I say that, look here, I am coming to your house tomorrow morning, it could be anything from 8 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock in the morning. Or if I say tomorrow evening, I will have an appointment with you, it could be from 4 o'clock in the evening right up to 8 o'clock in the evening. But after the advent of the railways, this notion changed. Now if I say I'm reaching your house in the evening, well, it will be precisely 6 o'clock or 6.30 or something like that. The railways reorganized time to suit their own ends, and passengers learned to accept the new rhythms of railway life. In Russia, the railway crossed seven time zones and imposed one time throughout. Wherever you were in the Russian Empire, whatever you were doing there, inside a station or on a train, it was always Moscow time. Railways forced not only standardization, but also cutting time down into ever smaller segments. And we rushed to meet those segments and make them important. 
Suddenly watches were worn by people because they had to know what time it was to do all sorts of things, get their teeth fixed, uh, anything, eat. It made no difference. And it came off the depot clock. You know, the people is living to time, especially in Switzerland. And uh, the Swiss people is working for time, working after time, working by time, uh, and so on, and has no, nearly no time to sleep because of the time, you know? In America, as the demand for living space grew, settlers headed west to grab land for themselves. In the land runs of the late 1800s, he who went fastest and furthest stood to gain the best land. The railway was a new weapon to speed up the conquest. We were a nation only 40 years old when the first railway trains began running. Therefore, railroads came as a godsend because what they did was two things. They allowed us to expand at an even faster rate. But at the same time, ironically, they also brought us together because they made it very easy to go from one section, one state, one territory to another, uh, all over the con eastern part of the continent. Therefore, we had, a, we had a feeling of political cohesion at the same time that we had this dispersion of population that would enable us to take advantage of the natural resources out to our west. At the time, I'd like to just introduce myself to you. My name is Gary Holtzoy. I am a member of the Navajo Nation. My Navajo name means a warrior of the metal people. This is how you say my name in Navajo. Travel itself was being redefined. As the new technology swept America, so the vast territory yielded to the demands of the immigrants. The train was creating new destinations for its passengers, as towns sprang up where the railway chose to go. This area of New Mexico and Arizona is still referred to as the Wild West an area occupied by Pueblo Indians who culture and history go back thousands of years, by the Navajos and the Apaches who came here just shortly before the Spaniards in the 1500s. The Santa Fe Trail followed an old Indian trail on which a number of Pueblos had established themselves. So this represented a large amount of land being taken away from Indian use and occupation. picked up on the fact that their railway went through Indian country. And they made a concerted sales pitch nationally, selling Indian country. They renamed their trains, the Super Chief, the Chief, the Navajo. They developed a, a calendars and posters and publicity in national magazines, all relating to the fact that come out to the West, see Indians see sand painters, see rug weavers, but take the train. The Santa Fe Railway organized what it called detours to give the ever more urbanized Americans a glimpse of their outback. Native Americans were recruited as players in the spectacle, as the detourists took trains, not just for travel, but for a sense of adventure. This was an ongoing national publicity, promoting a, an image of the Indian that, yes, was romanticized, and, and looking at it as the, the last of the, the noble red men, here is an opportunity to come and see them. And doing away with the fear of the West, it's not an unknown. It's a beautiful area. Come and see it. Come and visit. Suddenly, the people on the move weren't frontiersmen or, or rough and ready folk with their family who were willing to go out and brave the dangers. You could now get on a railroad coach, ride for 24 hours, find yourself on the edge of civilization somewhere, and you're just as mobile as Daniel Boone had been.
To publicize their new domain, the Santa Fe commissioned famous artists of the day to come to the Southwest and paint the original inhabitants and the landscape. The Southwest and its people were being recreated in the railway's chosen image. Having made the West accessible, the Santa Fe then began to make it hospitable. In 1878, they hired an Englishman, Fred Harvey, to feed their passengers, stylishly and quickly. The railway wanted to go first class. The Harvey houses, the restaurants, the motels or the hotels that were established along the route produced some of the best meals, best lodging that you could find anywhere in the country. Trains would stop at these Harvey houses You'd have several hundred people getting off the train, all fed, taken care of, and back on the train in less than an hour. Make room for the next train coming along uh, two hours later and doing the same thing all over again. He wanted his girls to look like nuns or like nurses. The training was strict, very strict. And Miss Jenny was head waitress in the dining room, and she had been with Fred Harvey 44 years then. And uh, Miss Jenny preferred that I didn't serve in the dining room too often because I was not graceful enough to suit her. They kept us so busy. Any time that you weren't serving people, you were busy folding napkins and being sure that everything was in perfect order. And even to this day, when I go somewhere and it isn't uh, well served, it bothers me because our training was so intense in that field. The silver was polished perfectly. The napkins were folded in a certain way. Everything was placed at, at the table settings just right. And it better be right. The linens came from Ireland. and, and they had beautiful banquets. It was really called the cultural center of, the, like of each little lady? town this along the way. This is fine, line. thank you. Everything's all right? Thank Everything's you. Everything's fine, thank you. Are you finished with your pie? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Take this away for you. You ladies? So that was, that was the, the, the touch of refinement he brought. Uh, if people have good food and clean places to stay, they become more civilized than if they're just out in the wilderness. So that's what we mean when we say he civilized the West. The train brought adventure for some and leisure for others. For the European rich with money to spend and time to enjoy it, travel became a new fashion. The blue train from Paris to the coast was all first class. The French Riviera, opened up by rail, was swamped by an excess of style. Pampered passengers had little to worry about. All they had to do was display themselves in the bright Mediterranean sun, now so easily available through the magic of the train. Nice was invaded by the English and the Russians, along with their royalty. What had been a run-down fishing port in the mid-19th century was transformed into an international pleasure zone. The borders between countries were made invisible. 
as those who could afford to cheat the seasons carried their social rituals south to the sun. Geography was being redrawn by the railways, and it seemed that nothing in the reach of the train would remain the same. Railroads were sold as the wave of the future, progress, a way to achieve expansion and prosperity and all the other good things that life promised. They were also sold as an invention of the gods put in the hands of man. There's a, there's a, there's a spiritual aspect to them, uh, to steam locomotives. They took on a life of their own. They're, they're almost they're most divine, right? And the interesting thing about that is it made the people who ruled the railroads, the people who ran the railroads, it also put them on a level of the deities as well because it gave them control over nature, as God has control over nature. It gave them control over distance. It gave them control over mobility. It gave them control over prosperity. That's the same kind of control that God has. And so the railroads very quickly were seen by the public as a divine scientific intervention in the unalterable march to progress. Before the railway came here, uh, Miami had a handful of people. As late as 1895, there were maybe a dozen people living along the Miami River, uh, and that was essentially it. Uh, the railway came in in April of 96, and it magically transformed this place. And this was a, the, an isolated area dominated by the Everglades with a handful of people living along a couple of the waterways. There was actually nothing here until the end of the 19th century. Railways brought prosperity to remote corners and extreme wealth to those who made them. In the 1890s, Henry Flagler, an oil billionaire, set out to create modern Florida, and he built it with railways. Flagler's importance to Florida, uh, it's not a case of saying it can't be overestimated. It's a case of saying that without Flagler, there would be no Florida. At least there wouldn't be a Florida that we know today. Flagler had dreamed up his version of paradise, and he had the money to make it real. He created a railroad going from Jacksonville all the way down to the end of Florida on Key West over the islands and the ocean. Eventually, boats that took people to Havana, to uh, Cuba, to uh, the Bahamas. And I thought eventually that his setup of the railroad coming down would lead to a transportation link with the then building Panama Canal. It would be one of the greatest links uh, of advantage, you know, in, in the entire country. Here's what a journalist of the Times had to say. It is to be doubted whether mere figures can give an adequate idea of the magnitude of Flagler's work. He has spent $41 million in Florida, $18 million on the railroad, $10 million in the Key West Extension, and $12 million in hotels. What it comes down to is that Flagler has made the east coast of Florida. The island of Palm Beach was no more than a coconut grove until Flagler came along. He created the most exclusive resort in America and built the Breakers Hotel as a haven for his millionaire friend. You can make an analogy, really, with Disney, taking an empty uh, section of Florida in the middle of the state and building his whole, what's now known as Disney World. Flagler here found something that was absolutely untouched, except for a few houses, and then could create totally what he wanted. Because Mr. Flagler was involved with what was then the 400 of New York, they'd already followed down and used his magnificent hotels in St. Augustine, and he thought they would come here, and he, of course, he was right. People began to arrive in droves. The hotels were immediately popular. He would bring the Hungarian String Orchestra. He even brought people such as Emma Ames, who was a famous opera star, Nellie Melba. It's even said Caruso came and sang, but I haven't been able to track that one down to more than legend.
Flagler's scheme struck gold as his railways unleashed tourism on Florida. However, he did not live to see his playground for the rich open to everybody. Remember, the people in those days went resorting, and they would come down, they had so much money, that they would come down and they would spend the entire season. And yes, initially, that was the concept, we'll bring down all of our rich friends. But they realized very quickly that in order to make all of these hotels go, that you had to bring down everybody. They added coaches to the formerly all Pullman trains, so that indeed those that couldn't afford the Pullman fares could still come down on the coaches. And then they had your home seekers fairs and your excursionist fairs. And the idea was, bring them all down. Get them all down, get them to spend their money, but by God, let's get them here. Pilgrimage had been man's first incentive to leave home. In France, religion and science were reunited when a young peasant girl, Bernadette Sobirou, had a vision. The new railway being built from Bayonne to Toulouse was diverted to the Holy Shrine and opened simultaneously with a grotto in 1866. Lourdes never looked back. The train gave mobility to the infirm, and thousands flocked to Lourdes in search of a cure. Special white ambulance trains were laid on to meet the demand, and priests held mobile services en route. Religion and the railway served each other faithfully as what would have been a local ritual became an international pilgrimage by rail. The steam locomotive on the cutting edge of progress and the promise of the future was equated in many people's minds with the spiritual aspect of, of the deity of God, that there was a sort of godly design in the locomotive itself. And it shows up in, in the literature that uh, the locomotive was a special province sent by God to uh, lead people to the promised land. The promised land may be west, it may be out in the prairie somewhere, it may be just over the mountains, but it's promised with a capital P. In the great cities, vast monuments appeared to the prosperity and grandeur of the railways. Stations were the cathedrals of the age. Cities vied with each other to create these altars to achievement and aspiration. For the new Grand Central Terminal in New York, money was no object, since by now, railways were ways of making money. There was a terminal built here in 1871. This is not the first one on the site. We had an open rail yard back that way, which is up Park Avenue right now. And between Madison Avenue on this side and Lexington Avenue over on this side, and from 42nd Street all the way to 59th Street, in the middle of this island, was an open rail yard. By 1902, there was a major explosion on a train right up there on Park Avenue where 15 people were killed because of all of the fumes, the steam, and the smoke. It was decided then that they needed to electrify these trains so they could bring them easily into the city. The engineers constructed a giant 43-acre roof over the entire complex. They dug 48 feet down into Manhattan Island to create three separate levels for the trains. Underground were 83 tracks to carry 700 trains a day. Above ground was a new New York. All of the air above this open rail yard was sold to all of the buildings that now line Park Avenue. They're actually built on top of what, what you could think of as a bridge. 
And the, the $180 million that this building cost at the day, which was too grand for any, any building project up to that point, was only affordable because they were able to sell all of the air above their tracks. And this was a new real estate concept. In fact, in the years between 1904 and 1926, the city of New York had its real estate prices go up by 26%. In this immediate vicinity, the prices went up by 244%. This was a boondoggle. It was an amazing way of making money out of thin air and an open rail yard. In Bombay, the British built a monument to the stability of imperial power. But what they left behind was a temple to the mobility of the railway age. Each train carries nine cars, and each train is supposed to carry 1,750 people, about 850 persons sitting and 850 persons standing. But now uh, you can see that each train is carrying uh, more than 3,000 uh, passengers. Uh, we are dealing with 2.7 million commuters here in Bombay per day. From the very beginning, while the railways were being built, they were thought of in military terms. Marx called them the light cavalry of capitalism. And Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, called them the shock troops of industrialization. So people thought in these military terms because they brought with them what you might call a natural good order and military discipline. So you had this emphasis on discipline, on uniforms, throughout railway companies throughout the world because, after all, armies were the only organizations spread over any area that required the sort of organization that a major railway company did. Mobile people posed a new administrative problem, and the burgeoning bureaucracies came up with a variety of solutions. In the same year, 1837, the postage stamp and the railway ticket were introduced. One posted mail, the other posted passengers. People felt that they were packages or parcels. They weren't human beings going from one place to another. It wasn't of their own volition. They were simply packages or bits of freight being sent by some anonymous force outside themselves to their destination. There are rules in the commercial manual uh, regarding the conveyance of snakes by rail uh, and the action necessary when these are detected uh, being carried in the compartments. Snakes can be carried uh, in the brake van, uh, should be packed in the boxes or uh, wooden baskets uh, with securely fastened, uh, closely fitting lids. And snakes are not permitted uh, to be carried with owners in the passenger compartment. Similarly, live tortoises should be packed in bamboo or hamper stick baskets. The basket should be of uh, such type that tortoises may not be able to protrude their neck out of the container. 
calves under 0.76 meter uh, in the height. Pigs, sheep, and goats. For man and beast, the railway set the terms of travel. Wherever they went, and however far. The railways, because they telescoped distance, made intermediary little communities less important. They had a terrific centrifugal effect, sucking the life out of smaller communities into bigger communities. And this applied in the countryside, in urban areas, and it applied also nationally, so that big towns, big cities, and above all, capital cities, could accumulate more direct power to themselves because the distance no longer mattered. There was no longer any distance between a king and his subject. A newspaper editor asserted that the locomotive engine has, in 20 years, become the great agent of civilization and progress, the most powerful instrument for good the world has yet reached, and become the most effective messenger for proclaiming peace on earth and goodwill to men. The age of locomotion is the era of progress. Wherever the railway extends, knowledge and civilization advance in geometrical ratio. Great quote. In Central Asia, the railway arrived with the Russian conquerors at the end of the 19th century. This was the old Silk Route, but times and trade had moved on, and the towns along the way were left in isolation. Russian imperialism was confronting Islam. Muslims dominated the Silk Route then and now. Ancient cities like Samarkand and its neighbor Bukhara were even more devout than Mecca and Medina. The religion of Islam was dedicated to the traditions of feudal society. It was against innovation, especially the introduction of railways. The Muslims associated them with the Russian infidels and tried by every means possible to prevent them building railways here in Central Asia. There were all sorts of speeches against them. And then in 1916, they started to destroy railway construction work, both in Gizark and we are at here in Krasnovodsk and in a series of other regions. When Russia began its policy of conquest in Asia, naturally the military were followed by merchants and bankers and this was true of Bukhara. They started to set up all kinds of joint stock companies. A railway was built across all of the Emirate, and in 1888, when it was finished, Russian money started to flood into this area. Whenever the train arrived, it delivered the baggage of westernization. But not all regional rulers felt threatened. The Emir himself was well disposed to the railway. He already had connections with Russia and Europe through trade. He had caravans going to Russia, so he was very interested in the railway to help his business, to improve transport communications. Some of the biggest merchants in Russia wanted him to allow the railway to go through Bukhara. However, the Islamic leaders insisted that the line should not cross the town itself, but go around it. So the station was built 12 miles outside Bukhara, at Kagan. By moving the site of the station, the local Islamic leaders could alter the route of the railway, though not its impact. What Nash Pradit? My great-grandfather, Benjamin Amenov, along with other Bukhara Jews, sold wines and spirits to Russian soldiers. In the late 19th century, before the railway, my ancestors had to bring distillery equipment here by camel. However, at the beginning of the 20th century, thanks to the railway, 
they could bring new equipment all the way from Berlin with much less expense and far fewer problems. So the construction of the railway was very important for my family. The business expanded enormously. The family became millionaires. Well known not only in Central Asia, but internationally. As the train traversed all five continents, it brought with it the sights and sounds of a wider world and overturned the world that people had known. With the building of the railway, local people came into contact with the Russians who worked on it. My grandfather met a Russian engineer called Lampen and took his teenage son to the engineer's house. When the boy saw the engineer's three daughters, he was overcome by how beautiful they were. He had always been told that such women would go to hell. But seeing these girls as beautiful as mermaids, he thought to himself, how can such gorgeous creatures end up in hell? From that point on, he could never again believe that the things told to him by his parents were true. lived before railways were made belong to another world. Your railroad starts the new era and we of a certain age belong to the new time and the old one. We who lived before railways and survive out of the ancient world are like Father Noah and his family out of the ark. The children will gather round and say to us patriarchs, tell us grandpapa about the old world and we shall mumble our old stories and we shall drop off one by one and there will be fewer of us and these very old and feeble. There will be about ten pre-railroadites left, then three, then two, then one, then none. would soon go faster and further than the train. Science and technology were now at the controls and human destiny was out of nature's hands. No shock would ever be as great as the change the railways made. Victoria Terminal Station in Bombay is part of this world which the railways have made. It's very simple. Florida is part of the world that the railways made. Современная Бухара – это часть мира, которую создали железные дороги. Grand Central Terminal is part of that world that the railroads made. <laughs> 